My name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book, need, uh, book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from the book. If you're interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now we are in the process of redoing the problems and we are on page number 282. Please turn to it. Page number 282. The very, two, very first problem on the page. Problem number 79. Let's see what they tell us. In 79, in problem number 79, the question is pretty straightforward. The question is, is, is the area of the triangle ABC equal to the area of the triangle ABD? Pretty simple, pretty straightforward question. Here's the picture that they give us. Triangle ABC looks like this. A B, C. We are told that it is a right angle triangle and on top of that we have another triangle which also happens to be a right angle triangle and the question simply is are these two areas equal? Let's see what they tell us, shall we? In the first statement they tell us, in the first statement they are telling us that AC squared equals 2 times AD squares. AC squared equals 2 times AD squares. Let's give this side some names so that it's easier for us to discuss these sides. Uh, the bottom triangle here is the right angle triangle. Let's call this let's call this base and height. Base and height. And the AD part, for the lack of a better term, let's call let's just call it X here. So AC squared, AC squared, where is AC? A to C, that's your H squared. 2 times AD squared, which we are calling X. So x squared, in other words, equals equals h squared over 2, and if we were to take the square root of it, it will simply h over root 2. So this is what the first statement tells us. Now the question is, what can we do with this information? In order for us to understand and appreciate whether or not this information is of any use to us, we have to first analyze what is being asked. The area of this triangle has to equal to the area of this triangle. That's the question mark here. Let's analyze this thing and let's see what is being asked here. Area of the triangle ABC, area of the triangle ABC is very simple. It's simply one half base times height, base times height. That was straightforward. Area of the triangle ABD is one half base and the area of the triangle ABD, which is the top triangle here, the base, the base of this triangle is actually X. This is the base. And the height of the top triangle is actually the hypotenuse of the bottom triangle. The height, one more time, which is this A to B, is actually the hypotenuse of the bottom triangle, which is simply square root of B squared plus H squared. There's nothing to it. Square root of B squared plus H squared. That's all. And the question is, are these two quantities equal? Well, let's find out. Half appears on both sides. We can get rid of this thing that serves no purpose. This and what else can we do here? Let's square both sides. Let's, let's square both sides. Oh, the next thing we can do here, I'm not thinking straight, we can substitute the x. We can substitute the x right here, which is which, which was the whole point of, of uh, using the information, which was the whole point. We want to see if what is given in the first statement will enable us to actually ascertain whether these two quantities are equal x we know is h over 2, we are told that from the first statement. Let's substitute this value h over root 2 in here. So it's h over root 2 times the square root of b squared plus h squared. Plus the question is, is this equal to b times h? b times s. Again, h appears here and h appears here, so that serves no purpose. Let's multiply both sides by root 2. Let's multiply both sides by root 2 and root 2 goes away. And here we end up with root 2 times b, and now we can square both sides. Let's square both sides. So here we have root 2 times b, and here we have square root of b squared plus h squared, 
b squared plus h squared and we're simply going to square both sides and if we square both sides we'll end up with 2 times b squared equals b squared plus h squared subtract b squared from both sides which is tell us that b squared equals h squared okay and I'm not going to continue too low here uh, let's, let's continue here the b squared equals h squared which, which means b has to equal h this is the question mark this is what it boils down to what it boils down to at the end of the day is are these two sides equal the base and the height and as long as the base the b squared equals h squared or b equals h as long as these two sides b and h if these two are equal to each other then the areas of these two triangles are going to be equal to each other the area of the bottom triangle is going to be equal to the area of the top triangle if, if it turns out that the base and the height are not of the same length then they are not going to be equal to each other but the problem is we have no way of knowing that the first statement tells us nothing at all about the relation between base and the height so the first statement even though it wasn't worthless, it is actually quite a useful information, but it's not enough. The first statement by itself is not enough. First statement by itself is not enough. Or can we squeeze this thing? We need the room here. Let's do it here. A D B C E. A D B C E. Because of the fact that we just established that the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now that the answer cannot be A or D. It would have to be B, C, or E. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us. Second statement, let's see what second statement actually tells us. Second statement tells us that ABC is actually an isosceles triangle. What do you know? It tells us that the triangle ABC is isosceles. Again, what we have to keep in mind is that by itself it does no good. Second statement by itself, simply knowing that the bottom triangle is an isosceles triangle does not enable one to, uh, to, to establish whether or not the area of the two triangles are going to be equal. That by itself is not enough. Second statement by itself is not enough. Answer cannot be B. But when we put the two statements together, we are done. Because that's what we needed here. After doing all the analysis, what we established at the end is that as long as these two sides are equal, then the area of the two triangles are going to be equal. Second statement clearly tells us that. Second statement tells us that these two sides are equal. It's an isosceles triangle. These two sides are equal. And therefore, putting the two statements together enables us to answer the question, yes, these two areas are indeed equal to each other. The answer is C. The answer is C. Let's move on to the next question, number number 80. Just give me a break for one second. Number 80. In question number 80, we are told that we have R and S which are positive integers. We are told that R and S are positive integers. The question is, can we express, can the fraction R over S be expressed as a decimal with finite number of non-zero digits. Boy, that goes on forever. Can it be expressed with a finite number of non-zero digits? For example, for example, if the fraction happens to be if R if R over S, if R over S happens to be 2 over 3, then the answer is no. The answer is no, this expression cannot be this this fraction rather, not expression, this fraction, this fraction cannot be expressed with the Question is, can this be expressed as a decimal? Can this, ex this, the, can this fraction be expressed as a decimal with a finite number of non-zero digits? The answer is no, this one cannot be because this one is going to go on forever. On the other hand, if it turns out to be 5 over 5 over 4, well then of course this fraction can definitely be expressed with a finite non as, as, as a decimal with finite number of non-zero digits. Let's see what they tell us. Shall we? Let's look at the first step. I need the room really, so we need to but I'll erase it eventually. The first statement tells us that S, S is a factor of 100. S, S is a factor of 100. So the very first thing we need to do here, and this is something we should not take forever and ever, very quickly, as soon as they tell you that, it only takes a few seconds, just two or three, five seconds at the most, 
to list all the factors of 100 very quickly. No need to put down one when one is a waste of time. So two, four, five, ten, twenty, twenty-five, fifty, and one hundred are the factors. And we are told that S happens to be one of these numbers. We just don't know which one, but S happens to be is a factor of 100, so S is going to be one of this. S goes on the bottom. So R over S, this fraction, even though even though we do not know the, what the value of the R is, but it's going to be some, some number on the top over 2 or R over 4 or R over 5 or R over 10 or R over 20 and so on and so forth. What we should realize immediately is that it does not matter what, hap what happens to be on the top. It doesn't matter what appears on the top. When you divide something by 2 or 4 or 5 or 10 or 20 or 25 or 50, we will always have a decimal that will have, that will have a finite non-zero digits. For example, a number divided by 2 will, have, will be 0 0.5, 7.5 or 37.5 or negative 22.5. If you divide it by 4, it's going to end up in 0.25. If you divide it by 5, it's going to be 0.2. If it happens to be some number divided by 10, it's going to be 0.1 and so on and so forth. Divided by 20, it's going to end up at 0.05. It might be 7.05. But the question is, this fraction, but the, but the point here is that this fraction can very easily be expressed as a decimal with finite number of non-zero digits. The first statement does the job beautifully. First statement does tell us, the first statement does enable us to tell definitively that this fraction, regardless of what appears on the top, will always be able to exp can always be able to exp can, be, can always be written as a decimal with finite number of non-zero digits. The first statement is enough. Let's erase all of this thing now. I need the room. The first statement is enough. A D B C E. Because of the fact that we just established that the first statement by itself is enough, we know now that the answer cannot be B, C, or E. It will have to be either A or D. Let's look at the second statement. The second statement tells us, the second statement tells us that R is a factor of 100. R is a factor of 100. Again, one more time, here are the factors of 100. I'm not going to rewrite them. R happens, now we are told that R happens to be one of these numbers. R happens to be either 2 or 4 or 5 or 10, it's a factor of 100. R appears on the top, so now we know that uh, what we're looking at is either R appears to be on the top, so it might be 2 over S, it might be 4 over S, it might be 5 over S, it might be 10 over S, it might be 20 over S, and so on and so forth, it might be 25 over S. The question is, is this enough? Is this enough for us to establish whether or not this fraction can be expressed as a decimal with finite number of non-zero non digits? Well, let's see. For example, if s happens to be 2 over 3, if, if, if s happens to be 3, if the s happens to be 3, then the answer is no. This fraction cannot be expressed as a decimal with finite number of non-zero digits. On the other hand, if s happens to be 5, then that will be fine. This will have finite number of non-zero decimal digits. But if it happens to be 3, it cannot be. We cannot tell. Unless we know what the s is, we cannot tell if this fraction, depending on what s is, may or may not be something that can be expressed as a decimal with finite number of non-zero digits. This is not enough. Second statement is not enough. The answer happens, answer turns out to be, answer turn out, turns out to be A. I'll stop right here. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? I'll stop right here because the number 81 uh, is not something I want to do in a hurry uh, right now. Oh, we'll take our time. It's a tricky one. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.